In the early universe, you had every type of particle flying around because the universe was really hot and dense. But then when these reactions stop because the universe expands, then these heavier ones decay to lighter ones, to lighter ones, and then the only one that would still be around would be the lightest one, which would be an excellent dark matter candidate. We asked the question, hmm, do you really have to form the ordinary matter and the dark matter at the same time? Dark matter, we, we, everyone's convinced it exists. Dark energy, ugh, we don't know anything about it. Welcome to the 24th episode of Apple Finch Pudding, your gateway into the world of science. Today's scientist is Catherine Fries, a professor of physics at the University of Texas. Her work focuses on cosmology and astroparticle physics. She's also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Catherine is also known as the author of the book, The Cosmic Cocktail, Three Parts Dark Matter. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for having me on your show. Before we start, do you have a fun fact for our listeners? Can I tell you about the thing that's most exciting me lately? That is that the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the sequel to the Hubble Space Telescope, started taking data about two years ago. And some of the very, very earliest objects they're seeing are, could be supermassive dark stars. These are objects that we proposed back in 2007. And so if they've discovered this new type of star that, that we had the idea for, boy, that would be exciting. That sounds very exciting. And also maybe we can come back to it later, but just it can give us a brief overview of what a dark star is. The very first stars that formed in the universe were made only of hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang because the other elements hadn't formed yet. And what we realized is that the location of their formation is very, very dark matter rich. There could be a lot of dark matter in there. So these objects, although they're made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium, could be powered by dark matter, the heat source coming from the dark matter. Dark matter. So 5% of the physical, uh, actually the physical universe, 95 is the dark side of the universe. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 25% is dark matter and 70 is dark energy. But what is dark matter and what are the dark matter candidates? Isn't that a bizarre universe that the objects of our daily experience, everything we know about, the, the air that we breathe, our bodies, our chairs, the stars and planets, all of that only adds up to 5% of the content of the universe. That is a really bizarre universe. And we know this to great accuracy. And I'm happy to tell you how we know the dark matter is there. And we're, we, but we don't know what these things are made of. So we're trying to discover the nature of both the dark matter and the dark energy. So I guess I could start with how dark matter was first discovered. This is a 90 year old problem. It goes back to nine, the 1930s. A Swedish scientist, Knut Lundmark, and soon after a Swiss scientist, Fritz Zwicky. Well, I'll tell you about what Fritz Zwicky did. He was looking at clusters of galaxies. And what he noticed is that a, ga a cluster is something that contains these, the cluster he looked at contains hundreds of galaxies. And he's watching the galaxy moving around the center of the cluster. And the, the galaxy was going too rapidly based on the gravitational pull of the other galaxies. And so he postulated, what if there's dunkle materia, dark matter, that provides additional gravitational pull that speeds up this stuff? So in other words, there's additional mass that is dark. It's not giving off light. That was an idea that he had in the 1930s. And then people have had a debate, different data showing different results. And it was really in the 1980s, the work of Vera Rubin, who nailed this problem because she looked at similar behavior in galaxies and found that every single galaxy has evidence for dark matter. The same kind of thing. You have gas or stars moving around the center of a galaxy and it's just going too rapidly. So something else has to be pulling on it to speed it up. So that was the original discovery of dark matter. And do you have any idea of what dark matter is? That is has 
proven to be a very tough problem. So 90 years of exploration and we still don't know. No, we still don't know what it is. You know, I think before I go on to that, let me let me describe. Actually, I can describe the picture behind me, the Milky Way. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, the center, if the center of the, of the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole in the center. It weighs about a million times as much as the sun. And it, that's a tiny, supermassive black holes are not the dark matter. They're a tiny piece of the universe as a whole. But it's still interesting to look, moving out from the supermassive black hole, you have these spiral arms of structure like a pinwheel. That's where the stars are located in our Milky Way galaxy, including the sun is along one of these arms and we're 25,000 light years away from that black hole. So we don't notice that black hole at all. But then this entire structure that gives off light, the bright stars we see in the sky from the Milky Way, that is in a flat plane. It's a very, very flat, we call it a disk. And it is surrounded by a giant spherical object made of dark matter. So the stars that we see there, they're just tiny. It's only a few percent of the, or 5% or so of the total galaxy. And the rest is dark matter. And so we really know from many, many pieces of ob observational evidence, we know it's there. And some of these candidates, there would be a billion new particles, new as in we haven't identified them yet, going through your body every second. Okay, and so it's, it's, it's everywhere, it's pervasive. How frustrating that we haven't figured out what it is. But you're asking what, what we think it is. And so, okay, okay, so let's turn to that question. Early on, people thought, well, let's try rocks or dust or ordinary stuff. But that's impossible for many reasons. For one thing, you'd have observational evidence of that if it were true. And it's, so that can't be. What we think now is that it's, it's a new kind of fundamental particle, not neutrons or protons or the other particles that we do know about, but something as yet un unidentified. And th this is where the particle physics comes in to it's fun. You have the smallest objects in the universe, the particles that are explaining the largest structures, the galaxies. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting connection. So as far as the types of particles, I can tell you about, huh, well, you know, there are many, many different possibilities that people are exploring. But let me tell you about one of the ones that is the, the most strongly motivated, at least on the theoretical side. The, they, these objects are called WIMPs. Weakly interacting massive particles. There are four fundamental forces of nature. And we know that dark matter doesn't give off light, so it doesn't feel the electromagnetic forces that we're so used to. It also doesn't feel the strong forces that hold our nuclei together. It does feel gravity. And of the four fundamental forces, there's one more. It's called the weak force. It's responsible for some types of radioactivity. So imagine if these dark matter particles, they're moving around in the galaxy everywhere, and they only interact with ordinary matter very, very weakly with this weak force. These, if you make this assumption that dark matter is made of these weakly interacting particles, then you get a very interesting consequence. People call it the Wimp miracle. Let me tell you about the Big Bang, the universe at the very earliest days. The universe started very, very hot and dense, everything very tightly packed, particles interacting all the time. And then as time went on, the universe cooled off, those particles expanding away from one another. If we go back to the early universe and we look at what these wimps are doing, they're interacting not just with ordinary matter, but they also interact among themselves. In fact, we think they annihilate among themselves. So when two wimps hit one another, they turn into something else. They're gone and they disappear. They turn in, but they turn into other particles. The energy is not gone. Just the original wimps are gone. You can calculate this annihilation process happening. And as the universe expands, the annihilation stops. We know how many wimps are left behind. Now, if you make this one assumption, which is that this annihilation process happens with the weak force, then you get the right abundance of wimps today to explain the dark matter. So is perhaps it's just a coincidence, but this is considered very good theoretical motivation for us to take these objects, these, part, these particular particles, very seriously as candidates for the dark matter. 
And you say these WIMPs uh, annihilate when they collide with each other and they turn into other particles. Do we know in what they turn, what they become? Well, they would turn into ordinary particles. Standard. We have the standard model of particle physics, mm -hmm. which includes the substructure of neutrons and protons and so on. And the annihilation products of the annihilation would be standard model particles. Now, you probably produce heavy standard model particles at the beginning, but then they decay into lighter ones. And at the end, the things you would get out would include electrons and photons, which are particles of light, very high, very high energy photons. And the third thing they would turn into in the end would be neutrinos, which are particles that we know and we know and study them every day. So these are all part of the standard model, these three possible end products of the annihilation. And the interesting thing is you can now go look for annihilation that still, I, I was saying it doesn't happen to in, in today's universe on the average, but if you go to regions where there's a really high dark matter abundance, which would be true at the center of our galaxy, so smack in the middle here, close to the black hole, there would be a lot of dark matter, okay? And there'd, there'd be a lot of dark matter annihilation going on and you can point your telescope and see, aha, uh -huh, am I seeing any of these end products of the annihilation? And very interesting, there is a satellite that is looking at these high energy photons. It's the Fermi satellite, and it sees an excess coming from the galactic center. So some people argue, well, maybe that's from dark matter annihilation. Now, the problem with that is that, well, there's other things at the center of the galaxy, and it's hard to tell the difference. And, but this is still an interesting anomaly that could be from WIMP, from the existence of a lot of WIMP particles at the center of the galaxy. So that's a possible evidence for the existence of these WIMPs. But you said at the center we have a supermassive black hole, but that's not dark matter, but we also have dark matter there. Yeah. The the, the uh, I was I was t saying that the entire galaxy, all galaxies, are made of these very giant spherical. Uh, that, you know what these are called? Halos, halos of dark matter. And I don't know why the word halo has nothing to do with the, the you know the halo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so these big spherical objects of dark matter, and the dark matter is particularly concentrated at the centers of all of these halos. So now every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the middle. If you add it all up, that's one millionth of the mass of the universe, okay? It's irrelevant for the, for, it's not the dark matter. However, moving away from that central black hole, then you have a lot of dark matter at the centers of galaxies and all other halos. And as you move out, the, the uh, amount of dark matter gets lower and lower. Maybe a bit crude, but why should we care? I mean, we have a lot of dark matter, but we don't see it. Why is it important to us? When it comes to basic science, you can always ask that question. And I can tell you the answer. Every time you resolve one of these big questions about the universe or about science in general, human life changes. You can't predict in advance. For every dollar you put into research, I don't know what the numbers are of how many billions come back out because of discoveries that are accidental. You can't predict what they're going to be. You can't decide. I'll give you, there's two good examples. One is at Bell, Bell Labs. It was a telephone company. Uh, it's now morphed into AT&T. And Bell Labs funded fundamental science. That was a telephone company. But they let these people do whatever they wanted. You know what came out of that? The transistor. Okay. Was Bell Labs telling people, go find a transistor? No, the idea of the transistor didn't even exist. It was an offshoot of this basic science going on at Bell Labs. In fact, people were very concerned when Bell Labs was told to split up because of these monopoly lawsuits, because their, their scientific engine was, was really very, very productive, and not just for telephone business. It was for much broader applications that people could never imagine until it happened. I'll give you another example. And this actually is relevant also to the search for dark matter. In Geneva, there is a particle accelerator. The, uh, it's at CERN, the Center for 
Centre, European Centre for N Nuclear Research or something is the English translation translation for CERN. It's 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 a French word, and what what is going on there is that you have a twenty seven mile ring, a circle. It's a circle, and they accelerate protons in opposing directions to nearly the speed of light, really, 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 really rapidly moving protons, and then collide them into each other. And then you study what happens at these collisions by putting detectors, giant, giant detectors are put there. One of the things that they're looking for, in fact, is the that when you smash these protons together at very high energies that you, you might get uh, dark matter coming out. These WIMPs I mentioned, one of the Another, I didn't mention, I didn't tell you about the second theoretical motivation for WIMPs, and that is there is an extension of the standard model of particle physics called supersymmetry. We call it SUSY for short, which doubles the number of particles. So every particle you know about would have a new partner heavier than the ordinary ones. Those SUSY particles would decay to lighter, the heavy ones decaying to lighter and lighter ones, but the lightest one would be a WIMP, and that could be the dark matter. The reason people believe in supersymmetry is because it solves a lot of problems in the standard model of particle physics that are unresolved. This is one of the reasons the LHC was built. This particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, was to look for evidence for supersymmetry and the dark matter that comes with it. it has, they, their discovery hasn't happened yet. Maybe they have to go to higher energies. Maybe it's it's a, it's a, it's frightening because there's it's these are the biggest data sets on earth they throw away most of the data theoretical motivation dictates which of the data they're going to keep it's too big you can't store all that data is that something wow. just, ah. that's insane discoveries could be going into the air it's really insane but the connecting to your question of why do we care about dark matter or more generally basic science i bet you don't know the biggest discovery that came out of these particle accelerators in Switzerland. I think I do actually. Is it the internet? No. Yeah. Well, the uh yeah, there was a uh, Tim Berners Lee was a computer scientist at CERN. So you're you're right. And the problem was you have all these scientists coming from all over the world to build these experiments and then they want to analyze the data, but they have to go back home and teach at their rel different different countries at the universities and in order to access the data, Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, specifically. So the WWW was invented at CERN so that particle experimentalists could access their data. They could deposit it all in one place. So there's another example of how basic science gives you a, a rather unexpected result that changes daily human experience. So just these two inventions it's completely changed human, human lives. I mean, imagine you'd have, without the transistor, I, I mean, we we wouldn't be on the Zoom right now. Every, people always ask, what's, what's science for? Well, just re remove your phone, remove the computers, remove, uh, you know, everything. Yeah, yeah, because I think, what was it? It was a really low percentage that they say that of fundamental science that actually delivers something, like maybe 10% or less, but it the things that they deliver far outweigh the cost of that other 90%. I think it's a billion to one or something. It's I don't know the numbers, yeah. but it's, it's huge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I, and, and this kind of, um, most of this science has to be government funded because companies can't afford that 90% that doesn't lead, in, lead to anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And why are you specifically so interested in dark matter? Now I'm 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 thinking to back when why did I get into science and da 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 but I guess I'll turn to when I was in graduate school, I thought I wanted to be an experimentalist working on these big particle accelerators. And because of that, I moved. There's another particle accelerator an hour west of Chicago called Fermilab. So I moved there, working on an experiment studying neutrinos, these same particles I mentioned before. But I wanted. It's an hour west of Chicago, and I thought I've got to get into the city. Uh, so I looked and I found, well, that's interesting. University of Chicago has a course in cosmology. And I started going there twice a week at eight o'clock in the morning. So that was interesting <laughs> because, you know, coming from out there, but I did it and I really hit the jackpot. The person teaching that class was David Schramm. And he was one of the founders of this field of 
particle astrophysics, connecting the smallest particles with the largest astronomy structures in the universe. So as a creator of this field, yeah, he was inspiring. And in taking this class, I just got more and more excited and, and stopped stopped going to the lab, honestly, started reading books about relativity and cosmology, and I really immersed myself in it. And I was just an auditor, you know, and then on the midterm, well, there was, an, I think, an average grade of 50. And then I was so excited that I got an 80. And he noticed, and he says, hmm, would you like to work on a project with me about neutrinos related, which would be related to my experimental work? And I came back to him and I said, well, can I be your student? <laughs> and in fact, I transferred to the University of Chicago to work with him. So he was the one who got me really excited about, imagine you're trying to solve this problem of what the universe is made of, and you could actually do something important. I still haven't told you what I did after grad school, which was I went as a postdoctoral fellow to Harvard University. And while I was there, went to a conference in Israel and, and talked to an interesting Polish scientist, Andre Drukier, who came back to Harvard with me. And so together, two of us together with David Spurgle, who's now president of the Simons Foundation, the three of us did, uh, I guess you could call it pioneering work. We wrote the uh, first papers making predictions for how these wimps would interact, scatter off of ordinary matter with these weak, with a weak force and realized that, we, that yeah, you could build detectors, you could build experiments to look for this. So the, the, there's a whole giant, there's a whole field of a wor the worldwide efforts of underground laboratories with detectors sitting there waiting for wimps in the galaxy to strike these detectors and deposit some energy in there. And there's many different ways people are trying to do it. It's in uh, everywhere, in, everywhere there's in, in mines in Minnesota and South Dakota, in Canada, underneath mountains in, in Italy, Korea, the Panda X is in a deep tunnel underneath the mountains in China, even the South Pole. So people are have built experiments to look for these interactions that we did the calculations for what you should look for. That, yeah, most of them have seen nothing. Okay. There's one Ah, it's very frustrating. But this one experiment, DAMA, which is outside of Rome, underneath the Apennine Mountains, they have a signal, something that we predicted. They're seeing exactly what we predicted. And But the question is, why do they see something when nobody else does? One possible reason is that their detectors are made of sodium iodide crystals, and that is simply a very different material from what the other experiments are made of. And then it's so it's possible that the details of the particle interactions are such that you they would interact with sodium or iodine, but they would not interact with xenon or silicon or whatever these other experiments are made of. So that's a possibility. So it is possible Dama has discovered dark matter. The only way to test it is to build other experiments with the same material, which is which is finally happening now. There's four other experiments that have also built detectors with sodium iodide crystals. They're taking data and give it a few more years and, and we'll see what they, what they find. Okay. So with a bit of luck, by the end of the next decade, we should know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be that they're in disagreement and that they see nothing. It could be that they agree. We don't know what to expect here. So you have these hints from the center of the galaxy, these high energy photons coming from there. You have these hints from the DAMA detector in Italy, it, but we don't know for certain what is going on with either of these. So yeah, wait and see. And you said WIMPs as the most probable candidates, but there was also something like machos, I think. Are they not in the equation anymore? Oh, that, okay. Let's go backwards 20 years. 20 years ago, the, that, those were fun times. We had the machos versus the wimps. <laughs> the machos were actually made of ordinary matter because although we know dark matter is not made of bright stars, the possibility existed that they would be made of stars so faint that we haven't seen them, or even substellar objects that are, if you get less than the tenth of the mass of the sun, then the, uh, the objects 
are made of the same material, but they they can't get fusion going in there, so they never light up. They just stay dark. So substellar objects, or it could be stellar remnants, which is when stars today burn out, then they collapse and become very dense objects that don't give off much light. So it could have been, so those are all candidates for machos. I participated on both sides of this debate, and some of the work that we did showed that machos cannot be the dark matter. So no, that's, machos are dead, desperately <laughs> looking for wimps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. You know, before we leave the subject of dark matter, I've only talked about the one candidate, but you know, there are a lot of other candidates, also well-motivated axions and people are looking for those. So also a new kind of neutrino that people suspect, suspect could be a good candidate, sterile neutrinos, primordial black holes, fuzzy dark matter. There are many candidates and people are searching and examining all of them. And are they all equally probable? The only two that have strong theoretical motivation really would be the WIMPs and the axions. And uh, what are the axions actually? They would be very, very light particles. They weigh very, very much less. They're uh, a million times less than the mass of a proton. Oh, I, I didn't mention the WIMPs are heavy. They weigh 100 times as much as protons. Well, between the mass of one proton or 10,000 protons. So they're, they're heavier than, and the, the axions are a million times lighter than a proton. So they're really tiny masses, but they're still moving very slowly. Uh, so both candidates are called cold dark matter because they're both moving very slow, slow moving particles, which has advantages in allowing galaxies and clusters to form in the way that we think they do. And axions were predicted as a byproduct of a solution to a problem in the theory of strong interactions. So I mentioned the strong interactions are what holds your nuclei together. And there was a, a theoretical problem with that theory, you know, theoretical problem with the theory. <laughs> and the solution to that automatically means that you would have axions as dark matter candidates. Then uh, it also became clear you can try to detect those in a multitude of ways. One of the ways people look for axions is that they axions can convert into photons when you have a strong magnetic field around. And that's what people do. They have a detector, put it in a strong magnetic field, and wait for the axions in, in the galaxy, if there are any, to turn into photons, because photons, is, that means light particles of light. You can detect those. And did we have any luck so far? No, those experiments are just getting sensitive enough to match the predictions that you would have from the strong interactions. Now, that's dark matter, or at least some of the large theory of dark matter. Um, maybe I quickly want to come back to something you said before as well. So you, you touched upon the theory of supersymmetry. Uh, so that means that like every particle has like some kind of brother or sister, like a, a counterpart. Yes. Um, what does that entail for the universe? I mean, what? how should we envision that? Most of them are, well, all of them are heavier than our normal particles. Mm -hmm. And most of them are also unstable, so they don't last very long. In the early universe, you had every type of particle flying around because the universe was really hot and dense. But then when these reactions stop because the universe expands, then these heavier ones decay to lighter ones, to lighter ones, and then the only one that would still be around would be the lightest one, which would be an excellent dark matter candidate. So the consequences for our universe in terms of what we see, what, what is out there today would be the dark matter. But in terms of on the theoretical side, what supersymmetry solves a lot of problems. One of them is trying to understand why, well, we don't understand why the, Particles of the standard model have the masses they do. Why do protons weigh 2,000 times as much as electrons? We have no idea. But we do know that a lot of these particles get their masses from the Higgs boson that uh, was discovered in, mm, what, 2012, again, at CERN by the Large Hadron Collider. This, this particle 
in order to give the for example it gives the math the mass to the electron however if you do the theoretical calculations that Higgs boson should should be completely crazy it should have a really really high mass itself which would screw up the electron mass but if you have supersymmetry then it protects the Higgs it keeps the Higgs mass where we need it to be so that's one of the roles of supersymmetry on the theoretical the theoretical aspects so we actually need supersymmetry for some of the observations to work. Well, it's called the hierarchy problem. So supersymmetry would, would solve the hierarchy problem. I'll tell you another thing that supersymmetry does for you. Those four forces I mentioned, as you go backwards in time to the higher temperatures, they unify. So it's kind of, it's really cool. So electromagnetism and the weak force, they unify. And in fact, you see that in the particle accelerators. This was discovered in the 1980s, the exact predictions, perfect, perfect matches to the theory. So they unify, and that would have happened at the high energies in accelerators, but it would also happen in the early universe. Now, what we'd like, to, what, what people assume is that, well, as you go to even higher temperatures, the strong interaction also unifies with this electroweak theory. You want all the forces to be described in terms of a single one, but you know what, in order for that to work, it only works if you also have supersymmetry because we can calculate the strength of the interactions, how they change with temperature and they all, they, they miss, they miss. But if you have supersymmetry, boom, perfect match. So there's another reason for supersymmetry, but all of this is theoretically motivated and you never know until you find it. But it sounds super interesting and super cool. <laughs> yeah, supersymmetry okay. is super cool, that's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, and now you said we went back to the beginning of the universe, but yeah, we also know that the universe is expanding and it's expanding faster and faster, and that's actually linked to dark energy. Can you give us some more insights on that? Well, dark matter, we, we everyone's convinced it exists. Dark energy, ugh, we don't know anything about it, and it doesn't it has no good theoretical explanation on the data side we don't know much it seems there are m many many pieces of data that that point to its existence yes and the, the original discovery was there are exploding stars called supernovae the ones that happened a long time ago turned out to be dimmer than expected and the best explanation was that they're accelerating away from us. That was the original discovery, and I, I personally wasn't so convinced. However, when you have, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, all the pieces start coming in, all the other data, the, the, the clusters, the uh, matching, the, the, the cosmic microwave background, da, da 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 I won't tell you everything, but it sure looks like, yeah, it looks, it looks more and more convincing, this idea of an accelerating universe. However, we don't know what it's made of. In fact, some people speculate that it could be made of a vacuum energy. And vacuum energy does not mean an empty universe. It's, it's a real thing. It's where particle, antiparticle pairs pop into existence and then disappear again. They only last 10 to the minus 43 seconds. They're yeah, virtual particles. Virtual particles. And they really do, they do exist. And they've been measured. It's it, in, in, in this room, there are, this is happening. So they, they take two parallel conducting plates and you can watch them be drawn together by the vacuum energy in between. It's pretty cool. Question is how much is there? If you do the math of what we think based on quantum field theory, the answer you get is 10, it, it's wrong by a factor of 10 to the 120. So 10 with 120 in the exponent, okay? It's, it should be that much bigger than it is. It's quite a big error. Well, it's called the cosmological constant problem, and many people call it the biggest problem in all of, all of science. Well, I should say physical science. So that's the cosmological constant used by Einstein, right? Yes. He originally put it into his equations, but in a, in a slightly different form. He was canceling it off against one of the other terms in the equation to produce a static universe, to get the opposite, no expansion at all. Well, that was just wrong. The universe is not static. It's expanding. That's an observational fact. But if you if you put it in at a sort of arbitrary value, typically what it does is call it cause an acceleration. So we're back. We, we That which he called his biggest blunder is now back. But it's, it's 
what what is the origin of it? We don't know. And it is possible that this whole scenario is flawed. It is possible that dark energy does not exist at all, but that instead we need to modify Einstein's equations. The uh, and people have tried that. I tried it in in two thousand and two. I had an idea for for doing that, and I don't know, maybe. But uh, yeah, this is it's a sort of the, on the theoretical side. It's a very difficult problem. The difference between the let me talk about matter in general. Matter feels gravitational attraction. Ordinary matter, dark matter, feels gravitational attraction. Sticks together, makes galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and so on. But some, the dark energy has the opposite behavior. It's repulsive. It's causing things to accelerate apart from one another. And so although we do understand matter very well, this other thing that's causing the repulsion, we don't understand very well at all. We don't even know if it was always a constant, the cosmological constant, or maybe it changes with time. And on the observational side, that's something that people are trying to test. With many, many telescopes going up into the sky that are going to try to figure out was the constant different as you go farther back, as you look farther back in time, it, it, it was, was it not constant? It, did it have a different value? Is there a time change? So on the observational side, that's something you can look for. And does that have an interpretation? Like, imagine it changes over time. What what does that mean? Well, there there is bizarrely very early in the universe. There's another period of accelerated expansion. At least we, it seems to work very well if you make that assumption. That's called inflation. And during this inflationary period, and we're talking 10 to the minus something seconds into the beginning of, of the universe, very, very early on, there are models for that. I have a model called natural inflation, but all of them, again, based on a vacuum energy, where that vacuum energy, once it dominates the energy density of the universe, causes acceleration, but that vacuum would eventually vanish, and the vacuum energy would turn into ordinary matter and radiation. And that's a theory people have been feeling pretty positively about because the predictions coming from it match data really, really well, surprisingly well. In fact, not just the basic idea, but the difference between models is now being tested. That So that's a, there you have definitely a vacuum that disappears with time. It's, and if you try to create a similar model for the dark energy, uh, that's more recent because this dark energy only started dominating much more recently, uh, then again, you, you, so you could have a time changing thing with a, with a uh, vacuum that was unimportant early on, but then became important recently. Maybe it's going to go away again. I, I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm personally fascinated by the idea that there could be hills and valleys in the vacuum energy were dominated early on. And then, there's, a, by the way, something called early dark energy that looks like it might be a solution to what's called Hubble tension that might have become important at a middle phase in the universe. So maybe there was another hill that played a role there, and now there's another hill. And yeah, so putting it all together in that way, I think, is fascinating. If only I could get my postdocs to work on that idea, because I like it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe also, what is Hubble tension? Can you explain that? Yeah. The... Hubble expansion that we've been talking about, which is because that's the expansion rate of the universe. The expansion rate today is a number. I can tell you the number. It's roughly 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So forget about what that what that means, other than the fact that you don't get the seven, you don't get exactly the same number may if you measure it in two different ways. One way you extract it is it's there from 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that's when the primordial light from the Big Bang that we see today was created. And if you, the calculations there have the implication for today's expansion rate that the number should be 67. But if you look at late time measurements more in the more recent past, such as these exploding stars and other things, the number you get is 72. The difference between 67 and 72 doesn't sound that big, but in fact, it is. 
they're considered to be incompatible. So it's that which gives the possibility, it's called the Hubble tension, that maybe there's some new physics we're missing and a particular solution to it is called early dark energy, where you would have a, a, another type of vacuum energy, a, a, a third one, right? That would be important just before this leftover light from the Big Bang is created. So if you had a vacuum, not domination, but 10% of the universe in the form of this vacuum, then you could then that would help the timing of, of, of when the first light was created changes a little bit and you get the right answer for the Hubble constant as far as agreeing with today's or the, with the later measurements. That brings me to one of your papers from earlier this year. So uh, the title is Dark Matter and Gravitational Waves from a Dark Big Bang. That sounds very insane. So maybe start with what is a dark big bang? We asked the question, hmm, do you really have to form the ordinary matter and the dark matter at the same time? The, in, the, what people typically assume is starting from this inflationary period, the very early phase of the universe where you had the vacuum energy that then turned into matter and radiation, people usually assume in that conversion, you make ordinary matter and dark matter. And we thought, hmm, maybe that's not true. Maybe you have a similar, uh, there's a, it's a phase, phase transition where you have a transition from the vacuum changing into this other stuff. And we thought, well, why don't we see how late we could push the uh, creation of dark matter? The first Big Bang would be the end of inflation, where you produce ordinary matter. But then we could have another phase transition, a vacuum energy that's subdominant. But in that next transition, you'd make the dark matter. We wanted to know, how late can you do that? In fact, we were hoping to have it coincide with the early dark energy, but didn't work. But the answer is the difference between these two Big Bangs, the, the latest you could push it uh, is, would be one month later because of various pieces of observational evidence. But in the grand scheme of things, the time scale for the, for, in thinking about the early universe, well, those are human time scales, but these are not early universe time scales. One month is very long from that perspective. The temperature has dropped an enormous amount from the beginning to where the, when the one month epoch. What are some of the consequences of that difference in time between the Big Bang that most people know and the Dark Big Bang? One of the things, I guess it was in the title of the paper, is the, the type of phase transitions we were looking at are happened by a bubble nucleation. So it's just like when you boil water, you see bubbles appearing. And if it is that kind of phase transition, then you, when the bubbles collide, you get gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves could be the explanation for uh, a signal that we see in detectors today called nanograv. And the, the type of dark matter that you get could be very different from the one we usually think about. Here, well, here's a fun one. There's, what did we call it? I think we called them Wimzillas. It could be very, very heavy dark matter particles that come as you're going through the phase transition, for example. You could have cannibal dark matter. You could have all different new types of dark matter. And the different ideas that we have would have different predictions, but all of them would have these gravitational waves that are actually seen in nanograph. So we, th we, we proposed, well, we have a new way to make dark matter, brand new way to make dark matter, and it could match these data. So we thought that was exciting, exciting combination of theory and data. Yeah, it sounds exciting. And so the dark matter in this uh, hypothesis or in these calculations exclude all WIMPs or is it combining them with something else no it doesn't exclude you know who says you it is possible there's more than one type of dark matter that's for sure if you think about it there's five times as much mass in dark matter as there is in ordinary matter well what if there's five types of dark matter and they all all the contributions are more or less the same that's possible makes it harder to look for any of them you only have a fifth as much to look for for each of them then the this statement that I made to you that a lot of these experiments have not found WIMPs, well, the, uh, the, their sensitivity would be a lot less if only a tenth of the dark matter is made of WIMPs. So then they have to look harder. 
if it's only a tenth as much, your sensitivity has to get 10 times as good. So that is, yes, people do worry about that. So actually based on the amount of observations, if we ever observe them, we could maybe infer what percentage of dark oh, yeah. matter is made of WIMPs. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay, but we have to find them first. Yep. And maybe some uh, side question, what are dark stars? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things. Um, the idea is these very first stars that form, and that would be 200 million years after the Big Bang. But to put it in perspective, our universe is now 14 billion years old. So 200 million is still relatively early. It's longer than a month, but it's still, it's still early universe. That's when the first stars form. That's when the universe transited from being dark to light. The way that they form, or the location they form, is in early proto-galaxies. I talked about the fact that at the centers of all these objects of the dark matter halos, the, very, the centers have a lot of dark matter in them. Well, that would be true in these early proto-galaxies as well. That's where the first stars form. And the way they do it is you have hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang that starts collapsing and in the standard picture collapses down to making very small protostars that get fusion going in them, the same power source that the sun has, hydrogen burning, burning to helium. But what we, the question we ask is, yeah, well, but there's a lot of dark matter around, what effects might that have? And what we realized is, well, if it's WIMPs, the annihilation of all, all these large abundance of WIMPs, exactly where this cloud is sitting, produces the same end products I've talked about before, such as electrons and photons. And those end products would get stuck. They, they interact with the hydrogen in the cloud and they would get stuck. They would sit there. What that means is you're taking all the energy that was in the form of the mass of the WIMP and dumping it into this cloud. So it's a heat source for the cloud. And when you have a heat source, it took another year to realize where you have a heat source yeah, you can actually have a real star. It's not just a, a cloud that stopped collapsing. You have a real star with a weird heat source. And we call them dark stars, but not knowing how bright they are, in fact. We, but we just like the name dark stars. The, these are very weird objects. Their radii are 10 times the distance between the Earth and the sun. They're really big, puffy objects. Beasts, I would say. They, they, uh, but they're very cool. The, there's no fusion, there's no core, the dark matter is everywhere, spread out uniformly. They start out weighing about one, about the same mass as the sun. And the real stars, they satisfy all the four equations of stellar structure. So what we did was then build them up, taking a, a, a uh, you start out with one, a one solar mass one, and then you throw on more mass, more mass, more mass, and it keeps accreting. The thing that allows them to keep accreting is the fact that they're so cool. Ordinary stars are too hot and they have winds that come off and they prevent stuff from falling on. But these, these, are, these are very cool objects They can grow. And some of them can grow to be a million times as massive as the sun, a billion times as bright. These are the ones that we call supermassive dark stars. Now you have two interesting consequences if they grow that large. One is that you can have an explanation for the supermassive black holes. In fact, supermassive black holes are seen very early in the universe. It's a very bizarre thing. How the hell did you make them? Well, if you have a supermassive dark star that it does eventually run out of dark matter fuel, it will collapse down to a supermassive black hole. Maybe that one will weigh a million times as much as the sun, but then you merge those together and you can even get them to, to add together to a billion times the mass of the sun which is what we see. We see very early universe, billion solar mass black holes, and people don't, didn't know how to make them, so we made this proposal. The second consequence of supermassive dark stars is, as I said, they're very bright, a billion times as bright as the sun. And now you have the chance, once you have a telescope that looks far back enough in time, that you could see supermassive dark stars. And that's exactly where we come to the James Webb Space Telescope, and that is now the sequel to the Hubble Space Telescope. It's been taking data for two years. They have 700 bright objects from the early universe. The, 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 the 
sort of vanilla explanation would be early galaxies with stars in them. But one supermassive dark star could be as bright as an entire galaxy of early stars, you see. And the thing is, if you if all these, they don't really know if these 700 objects are from the early universe or not. There's this, there's some indication that that's true. But if it is true, that's not consistent with the cold dark matter picture that I was telling you about. So that the it doesn't match the standard model for cosmology that we have. There's too many. Okay, well, what if some of those are dark stars? In fact, of those 700. They, in order to really know what they are, you have to have spectra. In other words, data at a bunch of a bunch of different wavelengths, different frequencies. They have that for nine of these seven hundred objects, and publicly available data for five of them. In particular, we looked at the four from the Jades survey. That's the James Webb Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey. Of those four, three of them are perfect matches to dark stars. We don't know yet, are they dark stars or early galaxies, but the spectra match, you can't tell yet, is it a point source or a more extended object? They don't have the resolution. And we predict in particular a line, there's an, in the spectrum, there would be a, a very sharp line from a particular type of helium line that they don't have the sensitivity to see yet. But so far we have candidates and with more data coming in, you're gonna have a lot more of these objects discovered by the James Webb Space Telescope. In particular, what we want are magnified ones and things get magnified. You know, this was another way to find dark matter. You have a bright distant object, but in front of it, you have mass of any kind, dark matter or a galaxy or whatever, and, the, and mass bends light according to Einstein's relativity. So the light gets bent around, bent, gets bent around the mass. And because of that, the distant object that the James Webb is looking at can be magnified. It looks brighter. And once you get one of these magnified objects, you can get a much better spectrum and you'll be able to look for these lines of, of particular, this one particular helium line that we would like to see. So in the future, we're going to be able to tell the difference between these different types of objects in the early universe. Oh, those are super exciting times. Yeah, so that's why I started with, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but for me, it's a fun fact. It's new potential discovery, so I'm excited. As we all should be. Before we close, do you have a take-home message for our listeners? Yes, especially for young listeners. If this kind of subject interests you and you're passionate about it, then go study it. Go find, I was very, I, I, uh, I found myself a great advisor and, and find, a, find a mentor like I did. That's my advice for young people. If you're interested, do it. So I guess we should all become a uh, cosmologist and astroparticle physicist because it's super interesting. This was the 24th episode of Apple Finch Pudding. I want to thank Catherine Fries for the information. Let's meet again for the next episode of Apple Finch Pudding.